had a few tech issues, so if anything goes wrong uh, as we go on, we may have to may have to stop and sort of figure that out. But we'll just we'll just start now. Good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Ben Gillespie. I'm the events coordinator at Clegg's and a PhD candidate in theater here at the Graduate Center. Our executive director, James uh, Wilson, regrets that he's not able to welcome you personally, as he usually would, but he's been tirelessly finalizing his work on the Drama Desk Committee, um, of which uh, those awards uh, nominations are coming out on Monday, so he sends his regrets. Um, before I have uh, Nick Salvato of the Clegg's Board come up to introduce our guest speaker tonight, um, I'd like to mention a few notes about Clegg's or the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies. Uh, coming up in two weeks, um, I just wanted to let people know uh, that we are continuing our really successful performing queries series with, um, by welcoming uh, performance artist Holly Hughes and theater and performance scholar Jill Dolan, uh, along with performers Joseph Keckler, who currently has a show on in the East Village right now, uh, and Aaron Markey, to a dialogue about queer pedagogy, performance, and the radical sexualized teacher um, in the university classroom. I'm also excited to announce that this series will continue next year with a number of queer performers uh, who will be announced very soon, so I'm happy about that. Um, and I wanted to just highlight a few more of Clegg's ventures this spring since we're getting close to the end of the, the calendar year and we um, tackled a lot of really important events. Um, these include, they included a, a major conference on homonationalism and pinkwashing in April which was extremely successful and is uh, available online on the Clegg's website at www.clegs.org. We've had a number of excellent speakers for events ranging across disciplines, including Dean Spade and Urbishi Vad, Carmelita Tropicana, Michael Schiavi, Ramsey Fawaz, uh, and tonight we have Madison Moore. Clegg's is currently working to create an online archive for all of these, uh, for all of these talks we made available, um, and hopefully that will come about soon. Um, if you're not already a member of Clegg's, we hope that you'll become one tonight. Uh, we rely on the generosity of our members to bring uh, you programming like, the, like tonight's lecture. Um, at the front of the room, you saw a donation box. If you enjoyed the event uh, tonight and are able to contribute anything, um, it will go into providing for events like this. Um, if you haven't received one already, uh, on the way in you may have saw a, one of our pamphlets, uh, which includes information about events. Uh, seminar series and fellowship opportunities. Uh, we have a seminar starting next week on queering uh, space in New York, so it's a four-week free seminar that you can attend on Wednesday nights. Um, and we also have a number of fellowships available to young scholars, um, so I really encourage you to check out those. Most of the deadlines are on June 1st. So uh, now I'd like to uh, ask Nick Salvato of the Clegg's Board to come up and introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Ben, um, for all of your work for CLAGS and uh, in getting all the logistics together for tonight's event and for everything you do. Um, I'm Nick Salvato, as Ben said. I'm uh, an associate professor of performing and media arts and the director of LGBT studies uh, at Cornell and, and also a member, as Ben noted, of the CLAGS board. And it's a real honor and pleasure to be introducing my colleague and interlocutor and friend, Madison Moore. Uh, Madison is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Theater and Dance at the University of Richmond, and not unlike the subject of his remarks this evening, one fierce scholar. Uh, Madison comes to Richmond and to us by way of Yale University, where he was a 2006 Ford Foundation pre-doctoral scholar, and where he recently earned a PhD in American Studies. Also the recent, recent focus of a front page profile in the New York Observer, Madison moves deftly and elegantly among discursive registers as he produces popular public intellectual and scholarly work with a near unmatched combination of style and rigor. His writing has thus appeared in forums as diverse as Art in America, Splice Today, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, Interview, where he is a regular freelance contributor, and Thought Catalog, where he is currently a staff writer. You didn't hear it from me, but he has also been the topic of an item in page six of the New York Post, and he surely ought to be the talk and toast of the town for his remarks tonight, and as his title has it, on the story of fierceness. So please join me in giving a fabulous welcome to Madison Moore. Thank 
class for the invitation and for all the fabulous work you do in promoting lesbian and gay studies. To Ben and Kale for his um, uh, social media prowess, I guess, and Nick for everything. Um, this is sort of a homecoming for me um, because a lot of this work um, is inspired by New York and I've observed a lot in New York, but I've actually never presented it in New York. I've presented it everywhere else, so this is a very exciting kind of moment for me. So the talk spirals out of two things. Uh, one is my current book project, which is tentatively titled um, The Theory of the Fabulous Class, which, if you know Beglin, is a riff on the theory of the leisure class. Um, and that project takes a kind of performance studies approach to the value of appearances uh, and fashion uh, and, and in an urban setting, and what sort of the performance of glamour means in everyday life. But it's also inspired by my work, uh, non-academic work or extra-academic work, uh, at having been at fashion magazines, having worked as a stylist, having um, helped create images for people. So it's this kind of creation or, you know, the kind of uh, theory and practice where you study, you know, art and sort of theory of the images and then you actually get to do that on your own, like in a photo shoot. So that's how I come at this topic. I want to share this work with you over the next hour by doing a couple things. I want to give a broad sketch of fierceness as it appears in popular culture. I want to tell you about the difference between glamour and fierceness, which is key. And I want to show you the different ways that fierceness has been used, who uses it, and why. Could you use the microphone? Can I use the microphone? I'm a low talker, I guess. I made sure my outfits didn't look like anybody else's. That was also because I had, a, I had certain associations of what it meant to be gay at a young age where I was super naive. I'm gay, so that must mean I have to be fabulous, and I have to make statements, and that must mean that I have to be what I thought gay was. And I did, to perfection. One day I bedazzled one of my shirts. It was, an, it was an athletic shirt, so I thought, well, if I put some jewels on, it'll be different. And then I started bedazzling my pants, and I started having this reputation that I would match my pants in the different decorations. Every outfit I would basically make the night before. I was not really liked, but then once I started being on sports teams and being fabulous during the day, that's when I started to get popular. I think it's because I started making a conscious effort to be seen instead of just being that little shy boy who cried all the time about stu stupid things. And from that moment on, I was like, I'm fabulous, I'm gonna be this, so get into it. <laughs> People were calling me gay and I didn't think I was, or I knew I was and I thought it was wrong. So then I thought if I just own what it is they think I am, which at a certain point I was like, okay, I really am this, I really am gay. When I came out, I, when I, came out, I started winning the battle of being gay. Me being closeted was not going to work because it was very clear that I was gay. People were like, are you gay? Yep, I am, what are you gonna do about it? Moving on, like, I'm gay, yes. I don't care what your opinions are. You have to accept me, and I'm also going to dress however I want to dress, and it's going to be okay because I need to express myself. I need to take ownership of myself. And that's when I think I became fabulous. There are so many challenges at so many times to my authority as a scholar, my author, my authority as an intellect, my legitimacy as a scholar, the rigor of my work based on my positionality. So for me, when I give that job talk or that conference paper, it's about saying, I'm here. I'm standing in this space. I'm representing everybody who came before me, and it's my armor. I feel like I use fierceness to put people on notice. Professors who looked out for me, who really believed in me, said, you look like you spend too much time and money on your appearance. You don't seem that, you don't seem that, you don't seem that serious. That can be a hindrance for you. But if I'm going to be in this space, I'm going to be me. To borrow a phrase from Fabulous, you can get down or you can lay down. Because I'm coming. So I think my clothes help me do that. My look helps me do that. It's me expressing myself in the space where I'm not supposed to be. When one of my advisors said to me, I know where you spend all your stipend, it made me... <laughs> 
I already felt like I was in a space where I don't belong. So that signal that I need to, um, that I need to let people know that I'm serious if they're taking me seriously. So let me tone down my earrings, let me tone down my bangles, let me put on my flash shoes, let me give them what they need to feel comfortable. But it just made me feel even less like myself and even less like I belong there. Because in truth, I realize that I don't belong anywhere. I create my own space. I do that by being myself. So I put back on my bangles. I put back on my wedges. I put back on my four-inch heels. Everybody else can walk in flats. If that's your space, work. I love a ballet flat. It's just not my thing. <laughs> when I look at my grandmother and all the women who came before me, they occupy an even more contested space. It's always about being subservient. So my grandmother would be walking into those homes while she was cleaning them, while she was earning her master's degree, in her fiercest coat with a white collar saying, you may think this work defines me, but I define myself. And here's how I, sign and here's how I signify that to you in my look. So when I think of fierceness, I equate, I equate it with what I heard growing up in the church. And it's like the spirit of excellence. You step out, you come for everybody. And that's the spirit of excellence. If you're going to do it, do it all the way. And all those church ladies with the big hats, they are like, what? <laughs> and all of the glory of God. I love that. It's just like everything to the fullest. That's because fierce is the highest level of expression, the deepest form of engagement. Fierce is not just to look. You know, RuPaul is fierce. Nobody comes to RuPaul. And it's not just because he has the face that's beat, but because he will beat you. Don't come for him. Don't. <laughs> He's not just a pretty face. He can tell you about any number of topics. When you come across somebody that's fierce, you're not just getting a look. You're looking at someone who owns that space. Of course, that's a tool for success because it's an incredible look, a high level of skill, and the ability to present all that in one. That's what makes people amazing. So in those two stories that I just told, what I think we see uh, is the power of fierceness, how people actually put it to use, how actually people make a place for themselves through appearance, through fashion, through uh, education, through taking themselves to the, to the next level. For Kadeem, fierceness was about winning the battle, as he put it, of being gay. When he, when he started owning his gayness, when he started bedazzling his basketball jerseys, that's when he started to sort of come into his own self. For Nina, a scholar, a black female scholar on the academic market, being herself is the fullest, is the fullest expression of self, staying true to herself, regardless of what the market says, regardless of you know, where she's supposed to be. And we, we hear her talk a lot about how I'm not supposed to be here, so let me take, create my own space, right? So what I think we learned from those two stories is that fierceness is a real survival strategy that people use to create or make a place for themselves. So why talk about fierceness now, at this particular moment? Well, on the one hand, I think that people have a lot of, you know, we all have glamour rituals, whether it's getting ready for a hot date, getting ready for a job interview, getting ready for whatever it is. There's a process of getting ready uh, and stepping into appearance. Um, and I want to understand how minoritized bodies step into that kind of appearance. And at the level of popular culture, fierceness is kind of everywhere. The Brooklyn-based artist William Villalongo has a new show at Real Artways in Hartford, and the title is Fierce. Mickey Blanco, who you heard on repeat, in the beginning is a New York-based uh, rapper, uh, also fierce. Zelia Banks, who has been called the um, pop's fierce new face, has a song called Fierce on her mixtape fantasy, which um, her whole shtick is um, borrowing a lot from house ball culture and voguing. Um, and she has a song called Fierce on that. Of course, there's RuPaul's Drag Race, which pays homage to Paris Burning basically every episode. <laughs> um, my favorite play is Patricia Field, um, where you can, if you want to get some fierceness, just roll on around down the Bowery, you'll be all right. <laughs> and of course, Beyonce, who made a commodi sort of commodify the notion of fierceness in her 2008 album, I Am That 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 Sasha Fierce. And an example of fierceness that I think is really interesting and strange, actually, is that the Abercrombie 
in front of Fitch Cologne, yes, the one that they have outside the stores and choke you with, is called, <laughs> is called Fierce. Here's, what, here's, what the, here's how they describe uh, the cologne. Fierce is packed with confidence and a bold, masculine attitude. <laughs> Fierce is not just a cologne, it's a lifestyle. The clean scent of fresh citrus will um, grab her attention, and warm musk will keep her interested. <laughs> well, in that case... <laughs> appears to be this sort of cute pop cultural phenomenon, right? Um, this sort of thing that percolates uh, outside of the place where it originates. What I want to talk about and convince you of today is how fierceness is a way that people who have um, been marginalized have, it's a strategy they've used to take ownership of themselves, regardless of the cards they've been dealt. And in this thinking, I'm really inspired by Kathy Cohen and her article, Deviant as Resistance where she tells us that we need to observe, you know, uh, observing and probing the agency of people who understand the expectations of the larger society and their communities, these people choose differently from what is prescribed, and this, how, this is how we must approach um, African American studies, right? And so the call here is that we need to, yes, these people are, you know, systemically oppressed, but what are they doing with that? How are they making a place for themselves? How are they creating their own artworks and their own sort of sense of community, despite um, what they're given. And this sense of resistance is exactly what I think fishness, fishness is about and what it does.
she posed an interesting question, and the question was, what color is glamour? When you're a grad student, you, you know what I mean when like one sentence can totally change your whole project. Right? What color is glamour? When she said that, to me, I was like, well, actually, what color is glamour? And so when I looked at popular black performers, Michael Jackson, Lenny Kravitz, Prince, Tina Turner, Grace Jones, Lily Ninja. Maybe these people aren't doing glamour. Maybe glamour is not what they're doing. Um, I think glamour is about preserving whiteness. And not just whiteness, but normativity overall. Glamour, we know, is an excessive way of presenting oneself. It's about sort of uh, luscious props, and it's this kind of dream, has this kind of dreamy, um, dream-like character. Uh, it's about the allure of expensiveness. But it really is about normativity. It really is about idealized masculinity, idealized femininity, idealized whiteness. Which is why, whenever you have a brown person, for instance, on the cover of a fashion magazine, oh, why do they get airbrushed? Or why do they get lightened? Their skin is lightened. It's to, again, uphold that sort of um, promise or narrative of whiteness. Glamour takes bodies and makes them legible and normative according to the lines of race, class, gender, and sexuality. So here's Marilyn Monroe and her kind of glamour drag, right? We have the luscious, um, the luscious lips and sort of blonde hair. Um, she is very sensual in this, in this image. And here's John Tay, who is a, was Beyonce's choreographer and is now a, his own sort of performer in his own right. Uh, and I think the difference between these two images is Marilyn Monroe is saying, look at me, I'm gorgeous. She's sort of asking to be looked at. And John Tay isn't asking me anything. He is just giving you an orange plastic wig. <laughs> You're going to get into it. You're going to get into it. You're going to get into it. And I think that's like these two images, if you want to just sum up what fierceness is and how, it, how it's different than glamour, this really, I think, thematizes that. In his really exciting ethnography of dance, underground dance music culture in New York, Kai Think and Cher comes across the term fierceness as it's used on the dance floor. He's doing an ethnography of sort of 90s dance clubs in New York. And he says that fierceness is used as a supreme compliment, meaning intense may apply to music, visual, or personal qualities. But I think fierceness is more than just a sort of congratulatory thing. I think it's a disruptive strategy that upsets norms. I think fierceness is a defiant and spectacular way of inhabiting social space, a transgressive working and working, which we'll hear more about in a second, of the self through creative labor of fashion and performance. Fierceness is minoritized creative labor. The Oxford English Dictionary cites 1384 as the earliest usage of the word fierce. And they say that fierceness is, or fierceness is formidable violence intractable savageness of temper, vehement and merciless fury. These are all words that seem to be about physical movement, their dynamic, violence, temper, vehement, fury. I think because of the consequence of that forcefulness, it's helpful to think about fierceness as a kind of forcefulness, in a way that it creates a breach in social norms and patterns of self-presentation through the urgency and immediacy of style. So I like this kind of definition of the violence, but what happens if we think of it as a kind of creative violence? What if fierceness is a kind of creative violence, a creative upsetting of, of, these, of these norms? There's another word that goes in tandem with fierce, and it is uh, work. Geneva Smitherman, in her uh, research on black speech patterns, she says that to work is to do something forcefully, completely, and with high energy and persuasively. E. Patrick Johnson is the one who theorized the use of the snap in terms of thinking about black gay male speech patterns and what, how it sort of punctuates the notion of fierceness. Right? I like this notion of work because I think it really shows how the creative violence that I'm calling for is a kind of reclaimed labor, which is what scholars like Joe Roach use to talk about how this 
labor is put on it. Kind of reclaimed labor, reclaimed work. I want you to go with me on this, on this part. And I, I found it to be really useful and exciting to think about work with an E, so the queer version of work, in line of Marxist uh, definition of, or discussion of alienated labor. And for Marx, alienated labor, or labor is a kind of slavery. You work in a factory and you produce these objects that are not, that are foreign to you, that are just sort of percolate and go down. You don't use them, you don't ever see them, they just are external to you. In producing those commodities, you yourself are a commodity because you are able to produce. You're able to produce. He sees that as a relationship of distance, as a way to say that you know these commodities exist outside of the worker, and in this way it becomes a loss of the self. I think that when you put the E in work, when you change the O and put an E, when you make it queer, when you queer the model, this model of work, we see that uh, work is in this congratulatory context, and it's a way of showing and proving one's own imagination, that it's a way of, in fact, bringing the work closer to you. You are your own object. You are your, you become your own, uh, you become your own work of art. So if for Marx, the difference between labor and his work is one of distance, work, with an E, queer work closes the gap between the laborer and his product. The labor is reclaimed, the labor is your own. of a 25-year-old 
working class, African American, and Latino, Latina community of diverse genders and sexualities. Community members have several names for their culture, including the ball world, ballroom community, and most popular term, ballroom scene. He says that this is a 25 year old uh, sort of thing, but actually we know that balls happen as early as 1869. Uh, you know, from George Chauncey and the Hamilton Lodge Ball, uh, and sort of rise of these pansy uh, balls in New York in the early 20, late 19th, early 20th century. Even Langston Hughes, in his autobiography, The, the Big C, describes these balls as uh, spectacles and color. He says, the strangest and gaudiest of all Harlem spectacles in the 20s, and still the strangest and the gaudiest, is the annual Hamilton Club Lodge Ball at Rockland Palace Casino. It is the ball where men dresses women and women dresses men. For the men, there is a fashion parade. Prizes are given to the most gorgeously gowned of the whites and Negroes who powdered, wigged, and rouged, mingle, and compete for the awards. Right. When you walk in a ball, there are a number of categories that you cho can choose to participate in. So this is another example from the Jonathan J. Jackson piece, um, European Runway Destruction, the ultimate catwalk diva, punishing the runway, coming from a foreign country. Or high fashion fall sportswear spectacular, the ultimate high fashion statement. High fashion trio, one pair of rock socking pumps, one fire pair of glasses, and one OVA slamming bag. <laughs> right? Now, there are prizes at stake. You know, you basically enter the category and you are the best and you win a trophy or sometimes money, sometimes a lot of money, uh, and also recognition um, by other people in the community. is a ball that I went to in Washington, D.C., which has a, I've been you know, in Richmond right now, and there's a huge ball scene in D.C., which um, is very exciting for research. Uh, and what I want you to notice um, are, um, okay, so you have a panel of judges in the far back, you have the makeshift sort of runway plane, and you have the person with the mic who's a commentator, and his role is to sort of narrate and tell you what's happening Yeah. 
you know this about the song? It starts to be something more that you hear out of DMX as opposed to something by like, you know, like a big house DJ or a studio or whatever. It's much more aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
first improvisational, but then very choreographed as it was mimicking like fight scenes and whatnot. But then when it became like uh, free for all ish, where like people from the sides just popped out. Yeah, popped out.
I think it becomes this, people people ask me, for instance, about what do how do I feel when you know um, the sister sisters makes a song called Let's Have a Kiki, for instance. How, what is what is that? You know, what does it mean when Mimi Weeks does teach this little girl how to read on a show like the New Normal with Ryan Murphy as thing? You know, yeah. so. Um, I don't have an, I don't have, I don't think, yeah, I mean, I think that this is something that brown bodies and upper bodies of all shapes um, participate in. On a similar topic, um, in, in relation to um, the difference between glamour and fierceness, how much of it, because I'm interested in it in terms of, in how this applies to language and reappropriation, all of that too, how much of it is, is productive when it's kind of borrowing and flipping it up its head versus So this is a question about language? Well, I just, that's, that's a related topic, but in terms of just, I mean, fashion and all that as well. I just think they, they sound very related in terms of just that. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, I think we're in a culture where, you know, citationality and cit citing things, you know, people say that there's no, th we've seen everything, there's nothing that, we haven't seen it that we can't make anew. I have a problem when something is cited and it's not, um, or when something is when something's appropriated and it's not cited. For instance, I think you can use it, but it has to. You have to somehow pay homage to where you actually got it from. You can't just steal it and throw it. You know, like you know, because there's a reason that these terms exist in this particular subculture. There's a reason that you know um, words like fierce and you know. Tr trade and the other terms that we heard in the What I Think I'm Fierce song, there's, there's a reason that those terms have a certain meaning within a particular community, clandestine community. My problem occurs when it's used but not cited. I've been to interrupt. Oh, yeah. Because you're first, I didn't you. Um, if I can just read you, you didn't cite Tyra Banks. And I'm pretty sure she was the first person to televise when we use the word fierce, even before RuPaul. And also to consider language. Um, well, we're talking about Tyra Banks, right? Who is uh, a fierce black woman. And then to address your question about, something we could think about potentially, about how language is appropriate or also, or reappropriate out of words like fierce, or even words like how, um, what was your, how did you put it? How did you phrase it? Oh. White. Yeah, that actually thinks you. Know, where do queer Caucasians fit? Queer, okay. queer Caucasians fit. I think part of it is like how queerness is commodified. And like part of that is like how the commodification of, of anything, really, right? So Marx talks about like commodification in terms of even like the word work, or like we appropriate a chain from an O to an E, things like that. Even when we think about like voguing, the first thing that comes to mind is a white woman, Madonna who's blonde and also fits the standards of glamour. It's when you think about like blonde, 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 blonde bombshells like Marilyn Monroe. But it doesn't get to the original part. And in, back in the 80s when we think about when people first started to vote in, in the ball stains, right? So that's something we could think about. Um, but you didn't cite Tyra Banks. <laughs> well, if you're going to read me, I'm going to read you back. And in fact, um, <laughs> RuPaul used Fierce in 1993 in the mm -hmm. movie Supermodel You Better Work. Wait, when? Supermodel You Better Work, 
I'm sort of wondering, I study female masculinity, and I'm sort of wondering, like, fierceness would be such a great term to adopt for the female masculine subject, or to use as a lens. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, do you see taking this project into, because I would hate to see it sort of flattened into just the excessive use of the feminine. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering, I didn't see any examples, like did you sort of, I have two questions actually, that's my mm -hmm. first one though. Like, <laughs> do, you, do you see any, did you see any potential for it or do you have any sort of ideas of, of exploring that potential? Um, I do intend to do that, I and mean, I knew someone was going to ask that actually. <laughs> um, so thank you. Yeah. Wait, yes. <laughs> um, but I thank you for that question and um, it's just, it's an area that I need to, where I need to just expand more. Um, I know also that Fierceness is used, when I've talked to people about this research, apparently it's used a lot in dance. Like, yeah. a lot of dancers, like when a move is fierce, right? Um, so I need to sort of investigate more of that area too. So female masculinity and dance are not just voguing, but. Yeah, also because it's like Jack Halberstam writes that the drag king culture is such a sort of a, you know, isolated, like outside of any kind of cultural presentation, even though it's been used sort of in Austin Powers films reference, but it's never sort of cited, so I think that would be really good. Mm -hmm. My other question is, how do you sort of see the nuance difference between realness and fierceness? Like, that's what I was sort of thinking, because, like, I, maybe generational thing too, but, like, Paris is Burning for me was like, whoa, mm -hmm. like, that was, and realness became sort of the, you know, in queer theory classes, like, study. So, so how do you see, like, the difference? But I do see them as different, I wonder if you could articulate it, though. Can you define realness? Can I define realness? Yeah. What do you mean by reality? Yeah. No, I'm just thinking about Paris' burning, like the idea of being authentic, like being, and sort of like embodying the ideal, like the way that it was used in Paris' burning, to sort of like, how to like be real, like how to be, a, like not necessarily even a real woman, but it's sort of like taking it to the limit in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how do you see that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
violence. It's not like loudness disrupts space. I mean, the fact that he, um, Kevin Daisy Potter is screaming by the end of that sentence, actually, and by the video that we saw, by the end of it, everyone's on the floor going crazy because the music is loud and he's screaming. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something about what, you know, the kind of connection between bodies and music and how it kind of is, um, let's say, an interpolation. I'm curious about like cost and expensiveness. So is there a connection or, or maybe a, um, what's, what would be like the opposition between glamour as being something that we look at as costing a lot of money as couture and one of kind couture and it's commodified versus fierceness, which is, um, you know, um, could it be, I mean, I, her question about reappropriation made me think about this, I guess, a little bit more, you know, something that need not necessarily be something that is so expensive. But then something can also be expensive and scrapped together from expensive parts and sort of like this brick and rack sort of thing, or you know, or, or, you know, bricolage, the way that's used in fashion studies. Things. Uh, what about that? So this is actually one of the main issues in my dissertation. I it didn't sneak into this um, right now, but in the dissertation, I talk a lot about um, Veblen, who talked about how, for instance, Veblen, who talks a lot about um, conspicuous consumption as being the way that um, rich people in the Gilded Age performed their power over you and their wealth and whatnot. And I found that actually now, you know, you can, who cares if the diamond ring is, you know, $10,000 as long as it looks real. It can be $5, right? Um, costume jewelry. What's the difference? Um, I think that either glamour or fierceness. I mean, you, I talk about Patricia Field, like there are things in Patricia Field that go from $12 to $12,000. So you can pick where you want to be on the spectrum, right? Um, I think it's about having an eye and knowing how to like put, compose things and com put them together and make it look expensive. You don't have to have the designer handbag. You can just have a nice, simple bag. And, or what, you know, like I don't think it's about, I don't think it's about money. Um, and a lot of my research on club kids, they make a lot of their own looks. Um, a lot of them are fashion students, so they make their own looks that they can't, that they can see in their minds, but they can't buy already. So, you know, it, and, and that only kind of furthers the notion of, of labor, like of actual work to right. produce these looks. Right. Something that takes work to make, but it continues on working. Yes, <laughs> you make it throughout the matter. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick, um, sort of piggyback on that. Have you read, there's a point where John Berger in Wake of Seeing argues that glamour didn't exist for aristocrats because their wealth was inherited, mm -hmm. that the glamour is only a, a, an aspect of bourgeois consumer society, mm -hmm. that, that when you look in a magazine, mm -hmm. glamour is trying to persuade you of something that you don't have. It's a promise. Um, yeah, yeah, which it, it's just such a counterintuitive idea that aristocrats didn't have glamour. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think it's a good thing. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think like someone like Napoleon was very much about making France, like, for instance, the, a space for glamour and luxury, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and everything that he did. That's what's so weird, though, is that like, uh, Madonna doing Vogue in the like um, dangerous liaisons track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, for me, it's, it's bizarre because she she returns to this very French Parisian world that I feel like Paris is burning. Like, kind of at least the promise was mm -hmm. to try to burn. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
with even like their hairstyles and their movements. So in many ways they, they wear, you see some of them wearing really typically masculine cl bit clothing, right? But then to me it kind of emphasizes the femininity, the exaggerated femininity of their movements where if you were to just watch a drag queen do the same thing, I don't think it would have the same, the same effect. You know, feminized parts of what you are wearing, you know, are emphasized because you have that leather jacket and hairy chest, you know? So. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't air today. Um, um, I think that's a really uh, beautiful comment, and partially because it's how I approach my own sense of style, right? The fact that I can wear these shoes because I don't have my, my chest is not shaved. It's sort of this kind of notion of gender fuck, again, which is right. exciting because of the way that you have the kind of collision between masculine and feminine or whatever the polarities are. Yeah, and it's just defying all the stereotypes. Yeah, and I think because it doesn't want to be, it doesn't want you to place it someplace. Exactly. And I, I don't have any research on this at all, but a term that I was sort of thinking about, you know, a few months ago is this idea of um, uh, creative, I don't know, or creative, creative dissonance, I think, maybe. Or like when it's like when you put two things together that don't match, but that's how it works, because it doesn't, because it doesn't work, right? Um, I was looking at a lot of like high fashion editorials in a magazine like Italian Vogue, which is known for their kind of artsy, edgy uh, editorials, and you'll have like someone in a wedding dress, but they'll be in a trash can, and it's like, that's fabulous, but why is she in a trash can? And it's fabulous because she's in a trash can. <laughs> you know, it like, doesn't make any sense at all, because you do that to a wedding dress, but that's why it's happening. So I think that that contra contradiction is, is really key in thinking about how this works. Um, I respect that you're still theorizing about uh, the floor and what it all means and stuff. I'm wondering, um, when you speak with performers, how do they theorize the floor for themselves? Um, Especially in the fall. You know, when I talked to Von Allure, he was telling me that, I asked him, like, I, the first question was, does it hurt? Like, what is it like to do that? And he says, you know, you get used to it. And you, when you, you practice, like I said, you, you can't just, we can't all just fall right now, but that it takes, it's athletic in a lot of ways. You actually have to put time into this and learning how to do this over and over and over. Although it looks improvised, it's, it's not. Or, or maybe it is when you know how to do it, actually. You know, when you have all the muscle memory and you know what to do. Um, he showed me the sort of different steps and you just sort of fall back on your leg and you, it looks like you're hitting the floor but you're actually hitting the back of your leg and so it's all of the sort of illusion, this sort of illusory thing, which is again sort of what Nick was saying. Uh, okay. Well, like all the thoughts, <laughs> I'll try and be coherent, but I think it's sort of an interesting thing that you are bringing out the difference between glamour and fierceness. That I want to say it was Diane Breland, could be somebody else, who said that elegance is saying no. And so, like, you know, the idea of glamour and elegance is this sort of, you know, it's putting up this, um, you know, like policing the perimeter and like putting up this sort of imp impenetrable bound between yourself and those who don't have what you have materially. But, you know, watching the Vogue video, it's like, you know, that's much more of a, um, it's almost like an ecstatic trance kind of thing, which is like, you know, it's a very permeable state of mind to be in. And so, it's, you know, I guess, to me it's interesting also to speak to what the ladies over here were saying about kind of like the numinosity of fierceness. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it, you know, you're, you're sort of mobilizing these interesting archetypal kind of things where I don't think, you know, as nice as glamour is to look at it, I don't think you can say that it has that kind of, it doesn't charge the atmosphere, you know, like anything remotely like that. So Be Because it's sort of the status, I mean, it's just sort of right, yeah. what we know already, right? And this excitement of fierceness, fierceness that we don't know what it's gonna be next, mm -hmm. you know, like that's the excitement that um, you know, club kids have when they create their new look for the next week, or you know, you don't know what you're gonna, what, what's gonna happen, or what you're gonna be inspired by. Whereas I think we pretty much know what Beyonce's gonna look like when she's on the cover of any magazine. We know, what, we know, we sort of know what's gonna happen. You know? Quick question about oh, right, Dan. I'm curious how, if, if you've talked to people about whether they see it as a form of 
play was that it was kind of like a DMX track. And this is because um, the music itself and the moves, I didn't, um, I originally had a clip of Willie Ninja doing it, but I figured you'd all seen it, so. Um, but if we compare what, how Willie Ninja dances in, in, Berlin, in Paris and what we saw in the last video, it's very different, you know. Um, it's even, I mean, that's very much about sort of maintaining those kind of high fashion poses. And this was not about posing as much as it was, well, posing, but like much more kind of maybe masculine poses. And I would say that the music and the dance moves themselves have like become more, more masculinized, more aggressive, more like closer to hip hop actually than music is. It's moving closer, closer to hip hop. Which is why someone like Azalea Banks can use ball culture and her music uh, as a hip hop artist, right? Maybe we'll just have like one or two more questions and they'll let you off the hot spot, Madison. And there's some questions that some of you may want to go up and then we'll speak to you after. Um, okay. That'd be great. Um, so I was wondering, did anyone bring up, in regards to the fall of the floor, did anyone bring up reclaiming that acted as like a part of like bullying or harassment? Um, not that I can think of, but I can say that uh, it is He DJs and he goes to balls in Finland. There are balls, and he DJs in London. He's out of the country almost every weekend, DJing another ball, like not in the states, well, in the states, but also internationally. So I think there's a sense that 
they know that what the, that the culture is hot. Um, and again, it gets to that question of kind of appropriation and paying credit and stealing it versus having it, you know, credit what credit is due. Um, yeah, they we'll always come. You know, the, the kids will always come for what's hot. Yeah. Yes. On that point, is very <coughs> excuse me, very powerful. And I love your presentation. It's, it's very pertinent because so many of the people who are in Paris and Murray, mm -hmm. uh, I'm dating myself, but I know most of them, some of them are still alive. Talk about the fact that Jenny, they don't like Jenny. Mm -hmm. They appropriated something, and she didn't necessarily do certain things that she promised. And that's a consistent issue of uh, the, that type of relationship, mm -hmm. that power relationship. And I do like what you did. I'm trying to talk about the idealized uh, of what the response, the resistance, because it's a thread that runs through, of course, black culture, mm -hmm. black expression, black creativity. So people pointed, pointed about dance, and <clears throat> if you know dance, it's, it's an appropriation of black dance. So those particular moves are not so different. It's just that it hasn't been institutionalized and, and it's never recognized. Because Martha Graham was up in Harlem looking at those moves. And not that it's a, a knock against that innovation, but it's a consistent historical point that there's always been in it. 